One very common observation by moviegoers is that the book is better than the movie. And it's certainly that way for many books that have been made into movies, but that it actually didn't seem to apply to one Stanley Kubrick. My own favorite horror movie that I'll be revisiting this spooky season is The Shining, and it's excellent in both book form and on film, though the two stories are actually quite a bit different from each other and are very good in their own ways. And it continued, even the relatively recent sequel Dr. Sleep is good in both forms if you like Stephen King's stories, yet also the film version which works well with Kubrick's movie. But sometimes it can get a bit weird. 2001. Stanley Kubrick's very famous movie that he co-wrote with Arthur C. Clarke actually stems from a short story written decades before by Clarke known as The Sentinel. That one is still an interesting and good story for having been written in 1948, but it's very different from 2001, and indeed the movie actually predates the full-on novel-length book of the same name, which became a series of novels that Clarke wrote. But 2001 itself presents a very interesting hard science fiction scenario where alien von Neumann probes, the famous black monoliths, enter the solar system from afar and essentially set up shop at the moon and elsewhere, Jupiter being one, all bearing a ratio of 1, 4, 9, but varying in size. There was artistic license taken in the very good sequel 2010, however. Jupiter simply does not have the mass to become a star or it would have done it on its own. And even if it did, then Europa would be baked by it due to close proximity. But the core idea of a civilization coming here and setting up shop is an interesting one, and also a plausible one. Such a thing could happen, and in a way it's mildly surprising that it doesn't appear to have ever happened in the history of the solar system. So far as we know, yet. So far, no convincing evidence of an alien presence in the past has been found in the star system, even though it's possible. But we've barely looked. That discovery may yet happen if some ancient defunct technology is found in a protected environment, such as on the moon, an asteroid, or even a comet. After all, no comprehensive search for this has ever been done. Thus, if there were something like Clark's monolith sitting on the moon, we wouldn't know about it unless we stumbled across it by chance, which is unlikely at this stage, since we've barely explored its surface. And that's one thing with SETI near and far. We've only just started looking, and the mantra that it's never aliens comes with the second part, until it is. People often forget that these days. It's a statement of ambiguity of detection, but does not speak to an unambiguous detection. But the search is broadening, with many countries now sending probes to the moon to expand our data set and increasing SETI experiments worldwide. Likewise, many of the moons of the solar system present very ancient surfaces that could also sport artifacts of a past visit, or even past colonization by aliens. Though oddly, despite its position as a good place to look for life in the solar system, Europa is not among them for a technosignature. Europa renews its surface geologically through periodic upwellings from the subsurface ocean, so it shows a sometimes shattered and mottled surface that does not preserve many craters. And any artifact that might have been there is now likely just some kind of remains at the bottom of the subsurface ocean, or ground to powder over the eons. But as to other bodies in the solar system that might preserve evidence, it doesn't have to be close to Earth. We have no idea how many minor planets and indeed major planets might lurk undiscovered in the Kuiper Belt and beyond. We've only just begun to explore this region, yet anything out there might also have served as a point for depositing artifacts. Even stranger, since these objects might remain undiscovered, even if they were still active we wouldn't actually know it necessarily, even if there were a full-on alien colony located on an object in the outer solar system. Doesn't seem to be the case for the ones we've seen, but for the ones that we have not seen up close, it's an open question. This has led to some interesting papers in the past suggesting that we might search Kuiper Belt objects for artificial lighting signatures that might indicate an alien presence far out there, perhaps placed there specifically to avoid interference with the inner solar system and our development. Interestingly, any of these objects could host enough radioactive decay in their cores to maintain oceans under ice shells, and thus a source of energy despite being distant from the sun. 
for a civilization to maintain an observational outpost on one. That's not to say that they do, it seems unlikely, but it is plausible. But for what purpose? In 2001, the idea was to seed life. And in the subsequent story, 2010, we received the message that all these worlds are yours, except Europa. Attempt no landing there. The aliens themselves were so incomprehensible that they never directly appeared in the films. Only their monoliths and effects did. Only communicating directly with that one message. And to a degree through what was David Bowman. But there may be other options for a civilization to set up shop in a star system other than to seed life through artificial panspermia. Indeed, life on Earth shows no evidence of this kind of manipulation genetically, though in the very earliest stages of it, it is an unknown. Rather, it may have been off-limits to intervene. Another reason a civilization might come here would be science. If you have a developing civilization in a star system, or even a general trend towards intelligence, then alien scientists may find that extremely interesting. A true abiogenesis separate from their own. And that might drive them to set up a science station to watch, but do everything possible to not affect it. After all, that would be contamination. And the whole point would be to see a pristine example of the formation of life and intelligence. That may indeed be a great question in the universe for all that get to a level to wonder about it. Often it's asked why aliens would care about us, we'd be ants to them. Microbes even less interesting than that. But this is a misguided viewpoint in that firstly our scientists are scientists. They study ants, and just about everything in the natural world they can, taking precautions not to contaminate their experiments. That may be universal. How interesting is a scientific discovery if you've contaminated it? At the same point, interference becomes an engineering project instead of a study. But going by humans and how we are, if we found aliens, our scientists would do everything they possibly could to learn whatever they could about aliens discovered from a distance or close by. They jump at the chance to talk about not contaminating it with biases and microbes, lest we not be able to learn as much as we could have had we not done that. And most certainly, if we had some magic way to go see them directly, we would. It would not matter how primitive they were. It's an exploration of life in the universe, and we'd set up shop and watch if we could, but not necessarily intervene. The prime directive, after all. So the idea that aliens wouldn't be interested doesn't make sense in the context of our own civilization and our motives and behavior, yet you'll often see it said, we would be like ants to them. Well, so what if we are? That still wouldn't prevent them from being interested in the anthill called Earth. Though in fairness, sometimes people pour molten metal into anthills to make beautiful sculptures crafted by ants locally driven to extinction of their colony via molten metal poured by a human. The artist destroys the subject in this case. Not good if that ever happened to us somehow. Another motive for a civilization to come here would be as a stepping stone to another star system. A sort of rest stop that has plenty of water ice and useful materials that they could use for resupply before moving on to their ultimate destination. Perhaps the most famous story in this grain is Clark's Rendezvous with Rama, where a craft passed through but ended up having no interest in us. There are also unknown factors. It's an alien civilization. It may have motives and interests far different from our own, and it may not be clear at all as to just why they would be here. Least likely, however, is an invasion with the intent of conquest. This is a very common trope in sci-fi, but one that doesn't entirely make sense. In that first, you'd be damaging the planet you're trying to take over by waging war with its natives, but you'd also have to target this world for some specific reason, such as if we were building some dangerous technology that poses a threat to the rest of the galaxy, something we are not currently doing. What they likely would not do is come here to steal the resources, because space is full of the very same resources. But in a much easier access form, locked up in comets, asteroids, and low gravity moons. As opposed to high gravity planets that take a lot of energy to get the materials into space. But there is another possibility here. While they may not want to destroy the inhabited planet in a system, they may have no problem terraforming another member of the same system. 
This gets into a question of ownership at large. Aliens may have no concept of this, and may feel that any unclaimed exoplanet is open for colonization. They may not take the worlds of other species, but they may take worlds in that species star system that are unclaimed. After all, there really isn't that big of a difference between a von Neumann probe sitting in a star system utilizing the resources of its asteroids, and something similar colonizing an uninhabited planet in a similar fashion. This actually brings up an odd scenario, however. It really depends on how an alien sees the universe and its own expansion, but it may be that star systems themselves are off limits if they have a budding civilization in them. The reason is that while an Iron Age civilization won't make use of the resources of its star system at large, they are close enough to the technology needed to do so that to envision that someday they may be a spacefaring civilization. If a non-interventionist alien civilization were to realize that, they might not steal the resources of a star system, rather simply leaving them intact for the budding civilization to use as they progress. Think of it as an extended prime directive, not just covering an inhabited planet, but an entire star system that eventually will be inhabited. This oddly is actually a viable solution to the Fermi Paradox, but somewhat different from a normal zoo hypothesis scenario in that there would be no zookeeper civilization per se, but a ranger civilization, guaranteeing non-intervention on the scale of solar systems to prevent the depletion of a star system's resources before the civilization native to it can make use of them and take its place among the galactic community. In this situation, the Great Silence should be no surprise, but someday the silence will be broken when we head out there and make contact with the Rangers, but not until then. Before that, we must remain in protected ignorance. But herein is the Halloween scenario. At some point, a civilization may decide to come to the solar system, not to invade Earth, but rather invade Mars. Say an alien civilization shows up and begins to alter Mars into whatever they feel is an ideal environment for them before we have a chance to colonize it ourselves. This is highly unlikely for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that they would need to literally show up right now, by chance, and start work since it seems likely we will have a permanent presence at Mars within 50 years, if not less. But to entertain it anyway, they might build an enormous civilization on Mars right before our eyes, and there's nothing we could do about it, at least with current technology, short of mounting nukes on gigantic rockets and launching them. Not the greatest of plans, however, since if you're dealing with a more advanced civilization than you are, then you're not going to win a war against them. We just have to sit and watch. Perhaps more possible than that is that of an alien civilization that has not reached space technology, a situation humans were in for longer than 250,000 years, and another technological civilization sets up a colony in their star system. When a primitive civilization reaches its age of telescope astronomy, their Fermi paradox, if they have one, would be solved instantly by looking at the other worlds of their system. This would be alarming from the start because they'd immediately have a boss that might never have interfered with them before their space age, but still controls their immediate space, meaning that they probably can't explore space much themselves with the police at the door. I think the most spooky end of the scenario is what happens if the dominant advanced civilization in this case never makes contact or says a word to the locked in civilization so long as they never leave their world. Stay home, stay safe, venture out, and you might get their attention. Don't do it. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently envisioning the opposite. What if the aliens came here, started terraforming Mars, and invited us along for the ride? I'd imagine the first thing we'd do is set up franchise restaurants and introduce the aliens to oyster bars, only to horrify the aliens who descended from analogs of clams. Thus the intergalactic unpleasantness begins. Be sure to check my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.